Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's community meeting for the Bus Network Redesign Project. My name is Reagan Cecchio, and I will be serving as the moderator for tonight's meeting. Next slide. I would like to note that all MBTA activities, including public meetings, are free of discrimination. The MBTA complies with all federal and state civil rights requirements preventing discrimination on the basis of color, race, color, national origin, limited English proficiency, and additional protected characteristics. We welcome the diversity from across our entire service area. If you have questions or concerns, please visit www.mbta.com forward slash title six, that's VI, to reach the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. Next slide. I would like to remind everyone of the rules for participating in this meeting, as well as remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded. It is also, um, while we wish we were able to do this meeting in person, we are hoping that we have designed an online public meeting that will be interactive and provide an opportunity for us to have a conversation together. Before we can begin that conversation though, I do want to review a few technical aspects of the Zoom platform. Next slide. We have ASL interpreters tonight for the meeting. Um, they are spotlighted and if you would like to see them, you can pin them to your screen. We also have interpreters tonight who are translating the meeting into Haitian Creole and Mandarin. I will note that our Spanish a language interpreter is running a little late and we hope uh, she will join us uh, soon into the meeting. If you require language interpretation services tonight, the interpretation button on your screen, the globe icon, um, select that and click which language you wish to hear. At this moment though, I will ask all English speakers to please click the same icon and select English as your chosen language. This will allow you to hear translated non-English comments during Q&A. Next slide. You can view closed captions by cl clicking the closed captions feature and selecting from the options shown. The show subtitle will display a caption at the bottom of the screen. View full transcript will display the meeting's audio transcription in a window to the right. Next slide. All attendees are muted during the presentation to uh, prevent excessive background noise. To submit a question, you can click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the window. When Q&A pops up, you can type your question or comment into the box, such as, what's your favorite candy? But we would like you to probably remain a little bit more on point tonight. Um, to provide your comment anonymously, you can click the Send anon Anonymously checkbox before hitting the Send button. These questions will not be visible to attendees once submitted but we will try to get as many, try to get to as many as possible during the Q&A portion of the meeting. If you have a technical problem, please share your issue using that feature at any point during the meeting and a member of project staff will respond as quickly as possible. And now I would like to introduce Caroline Van Ness from MassDOT who will begin the main presentation. Caroline. Thanks, Reagan. Hi, everyone. I am Caroline Vaness. I am the project manager for the Bus Network Redesign, and I'm really excited to be joined by my fellow colleagues today, David Panagor, the Chief Administrative Officer, Melissa DeLay, Senior Director of Service Planning, and Christoph Spieler, who is an advisor to the Better Bus Project Initiative, as well as other colleagues who will be joining us for the Q&A portion. Um, so with that, I would like to hand it off to David Panagor for opening remarks. David? Thank you, Carolyn. Good evening. My name is David Panagor, Chief Administrative Officer at the MBTA. We're pleased to be here today to officially launch our brand new bus network map as part of our bus network redesign program and kick off our first public meeting on the draft map. Transit is essential to the region's economy, especially post pandemic, and the MBTA buses serve our most transit dependent populations. This area has experienced dynamic change and we need a bus service that changes with it. It is essential that the MBTA's bus network adapts. We're excited to share our draft network map with you. 
This is a once in a generation opportunity to make bold improvements to the MBTA's bus network for the people that depend on it most. Now we're considering where people wanna go, where people live and where people work to create a better, more equitable service for our riders. But this just isn't a proposal to redesign our bus maps. We're also reinvigorating the entire bus system. We do that by envisioning a new, a number of new interesting routes they get people where they want to go, to new places of employment, and to new places of housing concentration across our system. We also do it by increasing service. We plan to increase bus service by 25% across the network and by 70% on the weekends. We also plan to provide hundreds of thousands of riders with high frequency service. That's a bus stopping at a bus stop every 15 minutes or less throughout the service day. To make these improvements, there are going to be changes and trade-offs. Changes can sometimes be challenging, but we think the benefits are clear. We're building a better and more equitable service for current and future bus riders that better reflects the changing travel needs of the region through a bus network that is simpler and easier to understand with higher frequency and better connections. We're excited about this, and we want to hear from everyone here, especially our bus riders. This is our bus network proposal, but it is still a draft. The map will change meaningfully based on the feedback we receive from riders. And hearing from you will make it better. Thank you. Carolyn? Thanks, David. And with that, um, we'll go to the next slide, please, Shana. Great. So here is just a quick agenda for tonight's meeting. Um, first, I'm gonna provide a project overview. Then we're gonna talk about goals, benefits, and trade-offs. Then go into our guiding kind of design principles. Um, and then wrap up with what's coming next and then have time at the end for Q&A. So let's get started in reimagining the bus network. Next slide, Shana. Great. So what is the bus network redesign? The bus network redesign is a complete reimagining of the MBTA's bus network to better reflect the travel needs of the region and create a better experience for current and future bus riders. Next slide. Why are we doing this? The region has changed dramatically in recent years, but our bus network has not changed with it. And we know that transit's essential to the region's economy and the bus serves our most transit dependent population. So it's really essential that our bus network adapts to that change. Next slide. The redesign is well coordinated with other initiatives to really maximize the benefit to our riders. So there is a program now to modernize our fleet and facilities, which will allow us to provide the fleet to run more service. There is bus priority work, working to get buses out of traffic so that buses can run faster and more efficiently. And then there's bus network redesign. And we are coordinated across all of these initiatives as well as many other initiatives at the MBTA, including making bus stops accessible and improving the um, rider experience and passenger information um, to do that and um, working in coordination to really maximize that benefit to our riders. Next slide. And related to that, municipal partnerships are critical to the success of bus network redesign. So to increase service in congested corridors where we know we have a lot of traffic, we need effective transit priority. Increased service will also require new and expanded layover locations. We will need bus shelters and accessible bus stops in new locations, and we'll need new and upgraded garages to operate this service. And in some cases, transit priority is especially critical for implementation where we know there is a ton of traffic like places like the Longwood Medical Area. Next slide. We've done a lot of work over the past few years to listen to riders and hear what's important to them. And, and these are just some of the themes that we've heard kind of over and over again. We've heard that great bus service goes where people want it to travel when they need it, is simple to use and understand, is fast, frequent, and reliable, and serves the people who need it most. Next slide. 
During the COVID-19 pandemic, bus ridership was more durable than any other mode, retaining four times more of its riders than commuter rail or ferry. And ridership during the pandemic has been less focused on traditional peak times, 8 to 5 p.m. on weekdays, and more focused on off-peak travel. This is something we saw pre-pandemic as well, but the pandemic really underscored the need to better serve um, travel during those times. And these new travel patterns overall just merit a new network that better serves all trip types throughout the day. Next slide. Great bus service also goes where people want to travel. So we've been using this great new data set, location-based services data, um, which actually really describes all travel in the region. So it is looking at car, walking, biking, and transit trips together so that we understand all different trip types, not just work trips, but also social outings, medical appointments, grocery store um, shopping, and, and things like that. The data is anonymized and unlinked from cell phone numbers to preserve privacy. And it's really some of the best data we've ever had on how low income populations and communities of color travel since it really captures all different trip types. We also conducted a public um, survey in the fall to help supplement um, this data and, and again, better understand if the data is really accurately um, captures the travel that people are making. Uh, next slide. We are setting up metrics to really understand if we are uh, achieving success. So these are kind of the three principal um, pieces of our, of our metrics. So is the MBTA providing transit critical populations with equitable transit service? Is the MBTA connecting people to the places that are most important to them? And is the MBTA actually providing good quality service or is it a good option for making these trips? Is it competitive with a car-based option? Next slide. And with that, these are the things that we're really trying to accomplish with the bus network redesign. First and foremost, leading with equity, prioritizing the needs of those who depend on buses and need frequent reliable service, and specifically improving access to opportunities and quality of service for transit critical populations. We also want to provide more frequent service throughout the day. This is something we heard a ton when we've done outreach that frequency is king and really helps provide more freedom to have that walk-up service experience. We also want to provide more all-day service, more, more trips during the midday, the evening, and weekend. And we want to connect people to more places, not just downtown centers. And finally, we want a network that's simpler and easier to use. Next slide. So in terms of the network that is out now, our draft network map, these are the things um, that you know we're, we try to do and that we see that we're, we're accomplishing with, the, with our proposal. So we are providing better service for low income populations and communities of color. So um, the network, um, this is the, the map on the left and it's highlighting our current high frequency routes and the network, uh, map on the right is highlighting the proposed new high frequency routes in the bus network redesign. And in the new network, 60% of residents of color will have access to high frequency service. And I should say that's defined by 15 minutes or better all day, seven days a week from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. Over 100,000 residents of color will gain access to high frequency service and more than 50% of low income households will have access to high frequency service, um, going to about 40,000 low income households gaining that access to high frequency service in the MBTA service area. Next slide. We are doubling the amount of high frequency ser service that we currently offer today with um, close to 300,000 more residents gaining access to 15 minutes or less all day, seven day a week service. So we are going from 15 corridors to 30 corridors with again, all that high frequency service. Today, only 27% of weekday service in, is frequent and in the new plan, it will be 50%. Places like Everett, Lynn, Medford, Somerville, South Boston and West, and West Roxbury currently all have no um, high frequency routes or all day high frequency routes. And now that they, now they would. Today, places like the Longwood Medical Area only have two frequent routes and now it would have six. Um, Seaport and Kendall Square will also gain new and improved frequent service. And we're also focusing on frequent bus service on corridors and connections that are not served by rapid transit today. Day. So when you look at this map, you'll see a lot of these new frequent um, corridors really complement our existing rapid transit network. Next slide. 
we are providing more midday, evening, and weekend service. So this is an example of Roxbury at 11 p.m. on weekdays, and the red um, or pinkish color here is not a high-frequency service, and the blue indicates 15-minute all-day high-frequency service. So you can really see the gains here um, in the Roxbury neighborhood. And, and overall, the plan adds 4% more weekdays, though again, it's a lot more if you look at specific neighborhoods, 30% more Saturday, and 90% more Sunday service. Next slide. We're also creating better connections to more places. One of the really interesting things that we've learned from the um, new data sets we've been looking at is that travel is local. Um, not everyone is actually trying to get downtown all the time. So this is an example of trips in Everett. And you can see a lot of travel is within Everett or it's cross town to Malden, Chelsea, Medford, Revere. And these are all places that we are highlighting on the map and proposing new and better connections to. Next slide. We are also just generally creating better connections to more places. So this is an example of some of the areas that are gaining access um, or that we're providing more access to. So the Longwood Medical Area will now have 200,000 more residents in the MBTA service area that gain access to fast and frequent service. South Boston Waterfront is 180,000, Back Bay is 50,000, and Kendall Square is 58,000. And, and to be clear, it's not just about gaining access to these destinations, but actually gaining good quality access that is fast and frequent. Next slide. We're also making service simpler and easier to understand so that essentially um, seven days a week, we're running the same type of service. This is an example in Revere with the old network, and you can see a bunch of kind of loops over here, and then the new network, no variations, the routes do the same thing um, all day, and, and they're generally straighter. And in the old network, only 24% of weekday routes were simple, and in the new network, it's 68%. Next slide. We're making changes all over the network, um, and we're going to talk about that more next, and I'll, I'll hand that off to Melissa now. Thanks, Caroline. Next slide, please. So we have a number of benefits that we uh, uh, are looking forward to as part of the bus network redesign process. We'll have 275,000 more residents who would be near high frequency service, that service that's every 15 minutes or better, seven days a week for 20 hours a day. Uh, we have 115,000 residents of color who gain access to high frequency service and 40,000 low income households who gain access to high frequency service. Overall, this represents 25% more service overall in the bus network compared to what we were operating pre-COVID. So uh, that's uh, substantially more than what we're operating today. And on weekends, that is a 70% increase in the service that we're operating. And there are 200,000 more residents who'd gain fast and frequent service to the Longwood medical area and uh, such a regionally important employment destination. Next slide, please. With this, we recognize that. Next slide, please. Uh, we recognize that there are a number of trade offs to consider uh, as we're designing both uh, an individual bus route or uh, an entire bus network. At the route level, um, there are many different people on the bus, and everyone is bringing their own lived experience. Some people value time and are very interested in getting home as quickly as possible. Other people value having access to that front door uh, and maybe more sensitive to, to where the bus stop locations are. Uh, next slide, please. We also are making other types of trade-offs at the network level. Uh, in this particular package, we uh, are making a number of trade-offs. For example, we are running less express service in some areas. Uh, but in general, those places are getting better local service People can still get to downtown via local bus and rapid transit connections. And in many cases, those areas are also now gaining seven day service rather than having service that was very focused on those nine to five, Monday through Friday uh, traditional commuters. Also, uh, some riders who do not transfer today would need to transfer, but new crosstown services also mean that many existing two or three seat trips may become one or two seat trips. Uh, today, approximately half of our uh, passengers who board buses 
are then transferring to rapid transit. So already um, feeding into the rapid transit network is a part of what many people are uh, familiar with. Uh, there are also some trade-offs. Some people would need to walk further. Uh, in the existing proposal, we have less than 0.5% of total riders who would need to walk uh, either a quarter mile or more to access uh, a new bus stop. Also, some service would change from high frequency to lower frequency service. But the flip side is that many, many places would see uh, lower frequency service get improved into new uh, higher frequency services as well. Next slide, please. This map shows uh, there are 99.97% of current weekday riders uh, who do not have to travel more than half a mile to access service. And a half mile walk distance is uh, what we use in our service delivery policy to define a sort of catchment area for bus and rapid transit services. Next slide, please. Here's another illustration of some of the different trade-offs that we're considering in part of uh, the bus network redesign process. Uh, for example, we have the bus route 450. Today, that route operates from Salem, and some of the time it continues as an express bus all the way into downtown Boston. Other times, uh, say on weekends, it's traveling to Wonderland Station on the Blue Line where people are able to uh, have that connection. Uh, for simplicity and better consistency, we would be proposing to have this route operate as a local bus seven days a week. So no one would have to think, what day is it to understand uh, where is the bus traveling? Or it would also simplify uh, fare collection as uh, it would have a consistent fare regardless of where passengers were heading. It would always be um, a, a bus fare, and for those who are continuing into downtown Boston, the combined fare would be the total cost with transfers would be one rapid transit fare, two dollars and forty cents, rather than an express fare, four dollars and twenty-five cents for a trip to Boston. In terms of com uh, travel time, the Blue Line does provide competitive travel time for those uh, trips into Boston, and uh, for some folks along the route who are uh, near to other. Uh, commuter rail options, those would remain available for folks uh, who desire the uh, train trip into North Station. Next slide, please. A different kind of trade-off that uh, we also have as part of this is that there may be some people who have a direct bus trip today who may have a transfer trip in the future. So take, for example, the route T101, uh, which would extend to Charlestown, Leachmere, and Kendall, and replaces part of routes 92, 95, and 326. Uh, take, for example, somebody in Charlestown today uh, on uh, Main Street uh, would uh, have a direct ride into downtown Boston, uh, but that trip is no longer available because uh, the Main Street bus service here, shown as Route T101, uh, instead is connecting uh, to the Orange Line or to uh, Leachmere and Kendall and actually also is serving uh, Winter Hill and Somerville and Medford Square. So someone who is looking to replace that Route 92 trip that they're making today would have a transfer available to them at either Sullivan or uh, Community College Station uh, or could also transfer to the Route 90 uh, three bus, which is getting combined with the Route 7. So there are a number of options for folks to continue making that trip that is available today. But at the same time, there are a number of new connections that become available. For example, connecting from Charlestown to Leachmere, or Charlestown to Kendall, or Charlestown to Somerville. So a number of different new options become available. And this does provide a direct connection from Charlestown to Leachmere or Kendall and replaces what for some could be an awkward two or three seat ride today. Next slide, please. There is another type of trade-off involving walk distances, perhaps. Uh, this is an example using the route T96 
in Medford, which is proposed to omit George Street, Winthrop Street, and Boston Ave in uh, Medford uh, to make a more direct uh, service. So overall on this route, frequency would be improved to be a high frequency all day service. So every 15 minutes or better, seven days a week, uh, so that uh, folks would be able to ride this route. They wouldn't be tied to a schedule. You could just sort of show up uh, at any time, seven days a week, 20 hours a day, and expect that a bus would be along shortly. This allows for a more direct route so that riders who are looking to connect either to the Orange Line at Baldwin or to the new Green Line Extension Station at Medford Tufts or to the Red Line at Davis would be able to have a faster, more direct ride. Uh, but the, it does mean that folks who are on uh, the segments of George Street or Winthrop Street would be within a quarter mile of transit service on T96 or uh, the 94 and also uh, on Boston Ave would have an alternate service. They would still have access to the 94 bus. Next slide, please. Now there are trade-offs we're not making. Other redesigns that other agencies have looked at have made trade-offs of uh, major reductions in service area so that they could um, have higher frequency service in the areas of highest demand. Uh, that's a trade-off that we're not making. We are planning to maintain overall network coverage. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're serving 99.97% of the riders who are served today. And the places uh, will still have service again within walking distance for, for nearly all of those riders. Next slide, please. We so I'll turn it over to Christoph Spieling. Yeah, so as we've designed this, this network, I've really followed design principles to make this network easier to use for the people who are riding it today and make it easier to use for new first time riders. So those include prioritizing frequency over one seat rides, creating rapid transit connections like the network does today, but also keeping going to create crosstown trips, focusing on all day service, combining routes to create high frequency corridors, minimizing route variations, and minimizing deviations on high frequency routes. So let's talk about all of these because you'll see them across the map on the network. Next slide. So first of all, we have a choice in designing a network uh, between frequency and one seat rides. If we want to try to create as many direct connections as possible between as many different points as possible, Inherently, all of those routes will be infrequent, which means people end up having to plan their day around when the bus is coming rather than the bus being there when they need it. Instead, what we're generally doing is having fewer routes, but having those routes run a lot more often, including those high frequency routes Caroline was talking about that run every 15 minutes past midnight, seven days a week. Um, that means there are some people who need to transfer, but those transfers will be happening between routes that run so frequently that you do not even need to look at a schedule. Next slide. Right now, the system feeds a lot of people into rapid transit. This is already a system which is designed based on transfers, but generally a lot of today's routes feed into rapid transit and stop there. That's really designed for people who for the large most part are going into downtown Boston. What we've done instead is said that when those routes hit a rapid transit station, they can keep going. People who are going to downtown get that reliable trip on rapid transit, but people who are going elsewhere can make new crosstown trips that the network doesn't currently enable. And we're filling real gaps there, that gap between Leachmere and Community College, for example, which has no service right now. Next slide. We're also focusing on all day service. This is a system which in large part has been planned for nine to five commutes, but we do not live in a nine to five world. For people who depend on transit service, they don't just need to go to work. They need to go to a grocery store on a Sunday. And obviously that grocery store on a Sunday, someone's working there. There's a lot of service jobs which require people to travel at all times of day. So rather than focusing service at peak and having infrequent service, during the middle of the day, we've really spread that service out seven days a week, all day. Next slide. 
We've also looked at how to create more high frequency corridors. And there's a lot of places right now where multiple buses may go down the same street. We found some places where we can coordinate those buses so that two overlapping bus routes will be timed so that they combine to create a high frequency service. Between the two routes, you get a bus at least every 15 minutes down that street, rather than today where those two routes may directly follow each other and then have a 20 minute gap until the next bus. Next slide. We're also minimizing route variations. Uh, the current system is incredibly difficult to figure out if you don't make the same exact trip at the same time every day because routes have branches. Routes do different things based on time of the day. Routes do different things based on day of the week. What we've gone to is making the routes consistent seven days a week so that you understand what that route does during rush hour on Monday. You know what it does during the middle of the day on Monday, and you know what it does on Saturday and Sunday. Next slide. We've also minimized deviations on high frequency routes. It is important to serve some destinations with front door service. And you see a real effort in this plan to maintain service to places like senior centers. But right now, the network often takes a route that has very high ridership and runs very frequently in order to make that connection. That means we're taking a lot of people and making their trips a lot longer as the bus goes out of its way to serve that destination. What we've tried to do is make the high frequency routes as straight as possible and use other routes to pick up those destinations which means we still have service there, but a lot of riders get faster trips in the process. So these kind of principles have shaped this entire system. Next slide. And with that, I turn it back to Melissa. Thank you. So uh, we're very much looking forward to this being a better network for the people who ride the MBTA. Next slide. I have a number of personas here to just give some illustrations of a, a handful of the trips. Um, this is our region-wide meeting, so uh, we don't have time to give a full explanation of all the changes, but hopefully this can give a, a taste of the types of changes that we're looking at throughout the system. So for example, we have uh, a persona here, Sylvia from Mattapan. Uh, who commutes from Metapan on Blue Hill Ave to Boston Children's Hospital, then transfers to the CT2. Now the CT2 isn't frequent, so sometimes she has to wait a while, or actually, you know, when she gets out of her shift at 11 p.m., the CT2 is not running, and sometimes she has to walk back to Ruggles afterwards. So in the new network, we're proposing to extend the 28 bus farther to go not just to uh, Blue Hill Ave and Nubian Square and connect to the Orange Line. In this case, it would connect at Roxbury Crossing, but it would continue farther into the Longwood Medical Area to Kenmore Square uh, so that Sylvia could get directly to the Boston Children's Hospital riding only one bus without having to make that transfer. Also, uh, with the promotion in uh, service to be every 15 minutes or better, that means that when she's waiting for the 28 bus at night, uh, it would be a, a shorter wait because today at night uh, or uh, on weekends sometimes, uh, many of our routes are only every 20 minutes or better. So this is a promotion in frequency to uh, many of our existing high frequency routes as well. Next slide, please. Another example, we have a persona cat from Winthrop who uh, goes grocery shopping on Sundays. Right now she can take a bus, the 712 to uh, Orient Heights and then transfer to the number 120 bus to go over to Central Square in East Boston. But with a five-year-old and groceries, transferring on and off the bus can be hard. So in our proposed new network, we're suggesting that there should be a single bus that connects East Boston, Revere, and Winthrop. It would be the new 120 bus. Uh, and actually on this, Kat has a number of choices. She can keep shopping in Central Square East Boston if that's what she wants to do. Or also we're, uh, we'd also have a bus stop over by the Target and by the stop and shop over by Beachmont if she prefers to do her shopping at other places. So this gives her a single ride back to Winthrop so she doesn't have to transfer with her uh, shopping cart and uh, child in tow. And then also gives more opportunities to get to more different places. Next slide, please. We have another example persona, David, 
uh, from Bellingham Square in Chelsea, uh, who commutes to the school. He teaches at an Everett by bus. Uh, he does have a one seat ride on the Route 112 today, but it's slow because the bus drives up and down two hills along the way and it's not particularly frequent. So after a long day in the classroom, he wants to get home as soon as he can. Uh, he would be better served in our new network with our proposed T104 route uh, with uh, all day high frequency service. It would have uh, every 15 minute or better service. So off the bat, that would be more frequent for him. And then also uh, we have a more direct route, the Admiral's Hill and Powderhorn Hill uh, would be served by another service. So this makes a more direct trip for a lot of people traveling uh, between Chelsea and Everett, like David here, or others coming from East Boston as well. Next slide, please. Here's an example, uh, Doug from Stoneham, who goes to see his high school buddies every week to watch a game. Uh, he lives in Stoneham and he meets up uh, over in Woburn. Uh, which even though it's only a short distance away, he has to take uh, several, uh, two bus transfers in order to uh, get between those locations. Uh, so in the proposed network, uh, there would be more suburb to suburb uh, connectivity. We have a proposed new Route 133 that would connect between Woburn and Stoneham and uh, feed into the Orange Line. Uh, that he'd be able to uh, have a single more direct option for travel uh, for his trip. And then one more example persona. On the next slide, we have Sam. Uh, so Sam uh, is commuting from Western Ave in Lynn uh, to get to work near Government Center. Uh, on weekends, he connects to the blue line at Wonderland when he heads into Boston for a game at the Garden. Sometimes it's confusing that the weekend bus does something different than the uh, weekday bus. And Sam also pays extra for the express pass for weekday travel. So in the new network, uh, there would be a more consistent service pattern with the 450 always going into Wonderland on the blue line. And then also it would allow Sam to be able to travel with just a regular link pass uh, as opposed to needing the more expensive uh, express pass to cover the, the trip into Boston. So those are just some illustrations of some of the different types of folks who are served differently by our proposed new network. Next slide, please. And I will turn it over to Caroline. Great, thanks, Melissa. So here is our project timeline and kind of what's coming next. So right now we are in the outreach phase for the draft network map, and we are doing three months of outreach that has already kicked off um, this month. And then we plan to come back uh, to the public to present, well, first of all, take in all of that input that we're getting and respond to that, come back with a new plan um, and present that to our board and the public in the fall. Um, and then we will continue to do outreach and communications around that new map uh, prior to implementing it. Um, and we are targeting the spring of 2023 to begin implementing the new bus network. Um, important to note here is that we are not planning to do this all overnight. This will be phased over the course of five years and implementation timing will depend on the structure of the final map and interdependencies of the new network, um, staff and public outreach capacity, especially operator headcount and the availability of bus priority. Next slide. Implementation will be an agency-wide effort. Um, uh, we will hire more operators. We will do extensive rider communications. Any new bus stop will be accessible. And we will be looking at transfer locations to identify potential capital improvements to make sure those are good locations to transfer. Next slide. So I wanted to just highlight some of our upcoming community meetings because today we're focused more on kind of system-wide um, questions, but there will be opportunities to do a deeper dive on your specific community. So next week we have the South Shore and South Suburbs meetings meeting and all of these uh, municipalities, we will be ready to kind of take input there. Next slide. 
on June 2nd, we have our Boston focused meeting. Next slide. On June 8th, we have our Mystic River and North Shore meeting. Next slide. And on June 16th, we have our inner core meeting. Next slide. And June 22nd, um, Metro North and Minuteman meeting. Next slide. June 28th, the Metro West. Next slide. And in addition to that, we have many other opportunities for in-person um, outreach as well. We've already begun that at different stops and stations throughout the network. And we are also planning for two in-person public meetings, one um, open house at the bowling building in Nubian Square and one in-person public hearing at Ten Park Plaza. So um, definitely a lot of opportunities to provide your input on this. And as David Panagor said at the beginning, this will only be made better if we hear directly from you, um, our writers on this. Next slide. Um, if you want to get more details, or please do get more details about your neighborhood specifically, we have a ton of content on our website, mbta.com slash BNRD. We have a, a, a bunch of different types of materials that you can review. We have um, different kind of neighborhood booklets. We have an interactive map. We have a trip planner comparison tool and a bunch of other things on our website um, to just get a better understanding of the um, proposal that we have out there. Next slide. We also have a bunch of different ways that you can provide feedback. So first we have a survey online, which you can see mbta.com slash BNRD feedback. We also have multiple events, as I mentioned before. You can also email us at the Better Bus Project email address. Um, you can submit written comments um, or letters um, here to Victoria Aretton, and then you can also uh, call us and, and leave a voice message. Next slide. We think this is a network that improves the bus experience for many riders, but we know and that this can only be made better because of your feedback. So we really do want to hear from you all and hope that you'll attend um, the other events coming up or just provide your feedback in the other ways that we identified earlier. So I think with that, what's the next slide? <laughs> And, and oh yeah, so just, just multiple ways to stay informed. Um, again, our project website is mbta.com slash BNRD. Um, and you can find out about other um, initiatives that we have going on at the T to improve the bus experience as well on our Better Bus Project website. You can sign up for updates. And then again, here's our Better Bus Project email address. And with that, I will now pass it to Reagan to moderate the Q&A portion. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I've been monitoring the Q&A and we've had a very active, lots of comments and questions. So that's great. Um, I do wanna just do some high level uh, more, I'm like the admin girl, um, some, some admin notes about how Q&A will work. Um, but I first do want to assure everyone that all of the comments in the Q&A are being captured and we are taking them all and they will be saved and included as part of the feedback we're um, collecting for this project. So wanted to emphasize that. And I also saw a question about how many attendees are here tonight and it has been fluctuating. It was at 2.31 a moment ago. So just wanted to share that. So um, I do wanna request that I see people have already have their hands raised and I'm actually gonna ask everyone to lower their hands right now, please. Um, because I want to review a few details about the question and answer process first. Oh, thank you all. Um, before you raise your hands to ask a question, um, I, I just want to note a few things. Ashana, next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, if you want to share a comment or ask a question, you will be able to use the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your screen or submit your typed question or comment. I'm gonna alternate between reading questions that have already been submitted, of which we have a lot, as you can imagine, with over 200 attendees, um, and recognizing those who wanna pose a question verbally. For those of you who are posing a question verbally, I will ask you to be brief because we wanna hear from as many people as possible tonight. People who are on the phone and wish to um, 
raise their hand, they can do that by pressing star and the number nine. For attendees who speak Spanish, Haitian Creole, and Mandarin, please raise your hand to provide your comments and questions verbally for interpreters to hear and repeat your comments. I am also pleased to announce at this time our Spanish interpreter has overcome her technical difficulties. So she did join us during the presentation. And so that is available for Q&A. Um, when we recognize your name, if you are submitting a comment verbally, you will be unmuted and then you will be able to speak. After you share your comment, we're going to lower your hand and then you will be returned to the muted state. Before we open the comment and question segment to the public, I am going to invite any elected officials in attendance or their staff to uh, raise their hand now so we can recognize and unmute you. So for those of you who are not an elected official, I'd ask you to lower your hand to, in, for the time being, and then we're going to recognize elected officials first. So if you are not an elected official, please lower your hand. Okay, so I'm gonna assume everyone with their hands raised is an elected official. So Amanda, can you un unmute uh, Pam Mullaney, please? Hi, Regan and everyone just wanted to say thank you on behalf of Boston City Councilor Liz Braden for an excellent presentation and look forward to attending the Boston public uh, meeting as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pam. Um, Mary, uh, Amanda, can you unmute Mary? Hi there, um, this is Mary Dean um, from the office of State Senator Joan Lovely. And thank you so much for this excellent presentation. And we really look forward to the North Shore meeting. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I see Caitlin Stapleton. Amanda, can you unmute Caitlin? Um, hi, everybody. My name is Caitlin Stapleton. Um, I'm with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. Um, I'm actually the liaison for Charlestown. So thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you. And uh, Leonard Diggins, I see next. And Amanda, can you unmute? Hi, I'm Leonard Diggins. I'm the chair of the Arlington Select Board. And clearly, I'm not speaking for the board at this point in time. I mean, I'm also a member of the MBT Rider Oversight Committee and the chair of the Regional Transportation Advisory Council for the Boston um, Metropolitan Planning Organization. And I just want to say, I think you know, the plan, this, this proposal is really great i mean the presentation is good but but the i've looked at, at a lot of the proposal the roots um especially the increase in the um number of, of high frequency routes and, and i'm impressed but really what impressed me is that there are some routes that are longer and i remember in some of the early discussions we there was an aversion towards doing some of the longer routes because of concerns about uh, being able to maintain reliability. So I'm glad to see some of these longer routes. And I know that you'll need cooperation from the municipalities in terms of bus priority in order to make those work. And that, so those may be some of the routes that come along later, but uh, whatever I can do in Arlington to help on that, you know, please let me know, but more power to you and stick with it. Thank you. Thank you, Len. Thank you for your comments. Um, so for those of you who may have just joined, because I see the numbers have increased, we're taking comments and questions from elected officials and their staff right now. So I see Anthony Baez next. Amanda, can you unmute Anthony? Hi, thank you for having us. Um, my name is Anthony. I'm representing um, District 8 City Council of Boston, Kenzie Bach. Um, we're just here to see what people think, get some feedback about the plans, um, but also just maybe seeing um, what changes could be made to downtown. Um, it obviously is important to us that downtown is just as connected as the rest of Boston. Thank you for your comments. Um, Ariana Turner is next. Amanda, can you unmute? Hi, this is Ariana. Um, I'm from Senator Will Brownsberger's office. Um, just wanted to say thank you for um, this presentation and we're all really excited um, for this new bus network and for the upcoming meetings. Thank you for participating. 
Um, so the next person I have is uh, dialing in by phone and the last three digits of the phone number are 982. So we'll unmute you. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Gerard Boucher. I'm on the advisory board in Haverhill and uh, I represent the disabled commuters. And uh, I didn't hear really hear you say anything about the handicapped buses. Also, I wanted to mention that drivers that see a person with a white cane are uh, supposed to stop and ask that blind person if they're waiting for the bus. And I want to thank you for having these uh, these calls and these conferences. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I don't know if anyone from the team would like to respond to how um, how these uh, uh, how this proposal uh, intersects um, with people who use the ride, I guess, and other services. Yeah, and I did see a question about um, the cell phone data too and how it undercounts seniors and, and people with disabilities, which is absolutely true, by the way, and that my apologies for not mentioning that. We actually did some extra outreach working with different community-based orgs, um, specifically the Mass Senior Action Council, as well as um, system-wide accessibility in the BCIL group um, to, to do some extra outreach to those populations to um, make sure that we were hearing um, from, from those folks. Um, and, and generally we've, we've tried to just target, um, hearing from those people more, um, as sometimes we just, we don't hear from them enough so that we are actually planning some additional meetings with the Mass Senior Action Council and the BCIL group now. So, um, that is in progress. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so, uh, I think I see, uh, uh, Kenya Beeman next. Amanda, do you mind unmuting? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So, hi, uh, this is Kenya Beeman here. I just want to uh, say I'm glad to be a part of this meeting. Um, I'm one of the community engagement managers at the DPDA, uh, also known as the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Um, I'm actually really glad to see the work that's being done from the Mattapan end of the city going into Longwood area. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your comments tonight. Um, and then I, we see, I see Dante uh, Peebles next. Yes, how are we doing? Um, uh, Dante, my name is Dante Peebles. I'm actually the uh, liaison for Mattapan and Lower Dorchester for the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. I uh, just want to say thank you for the uh, presentation and information that you shared today. Um, also, just really looking ahead to any um, information, information that could be sent around to neighbors. Um, and uh, looking forward to the upcoming meetings. I want to second the um, comments by Kenya about the work through for uh, Mattapan to Longwood. So I just want to say thank you for the presentation again, and I'm glad to be here. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you for your comments. Do we have, I see some new new hands raised, but um, I just want to really quick see, um, make sure that we've collected all the comments from elected officials. If you're not an elected official, if you could lower your hand or a member of their staff for right now. And then we'll get to some more. Great. So, all right. So, uh, Robert Peters, Amanda, can you unmute? Uh, thank you. I'm Robert Peters. I'm the chair of the planning board in the town of Lexington. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, one thing that uh, I'd like to see, though, is, uh, and I think the, the example of Stone and Woburn, I think, is great, but more. Um, uh, uh, ability to get cross town. So like uh, 128 connects for drivers, uh, certainly Burlington, uh, Lexington, Waltham. And I think connections like that for folks who don't have uh, access to a vehicle and need need the uh, transportation for employment is really critical. So thank you again for the presentation. Thank you for your comments. And I think the last person I see for elected officials and staff, uh, Colleen Bradley MacArthur. Amanda, can you unmute? Hi there. Uh, this is Colleen Bradley MacArthur, and I am a city councilor at large in Waltham. And I want to second what uh, the previous person said, and I'm so sorry I missed your name, but um, we are definitely. Um, 
looking at prioritizing more connections in North Waltham specifically. And I also would love to get some more information on how to connect the uh, disabled community here in Waltham with any initiatives that you have um, with any other groups um, that you have specifically regarding access um, and disability access. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you for your offer as well. I did just want to flag to um, Victoria, maybe you can pop up on the screen real quick because we're getting a lot of questions about community engagement. Just wanted to introduce Victoria to respond. I think Victoria that. is in the other language oh, okay. channel, so well, she cannot. <laughs> sorry, Victoria, to call you out. Um, I, I just did want to um, send people to, I believe, um, it is community engagement at mbta.com is the email address um, that will that um, Victoria read on who just started a few months ago, who's the new deputy director of community engagement. Um, she's been doing a phenomenal job in connecting us with different community based orgs. So if you have thoughts on um, organizations that we should be connecting with, I would definitely recommend um, emailing that email ad address. Again, it's community engagement, I think, I hope, community engagement at MBTA. Okay, Reagan's nodding. Community engagement at MBTA.com, or um, you can always get in touch with us too at the Better Best Project email address too. Oh, oh, it's yeah, public engagement. engagement. Okay, <laughs> see, I knew I had it wrong. Public engagement at MBTA.com. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Um, so I think the last uh, elected official staff comment is Joanne Daniels Feingold. I'm mute. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not an elected official, but I was a first name plaintiff in the T accessibility case, Daniel Spinkel versus the MBTA. I'm also on the RTAG board. I'm glad you're having this series of meetings, but I'm disappointed in the out public outreach regarding the meetings. I wouldn't have known about them. And I'm very much engaged with, with things at the T and with uh, meetings and events at the T. Uh, if I hadn't gotten an email from Jennifer Ross inviting me to this meeting. Um, I think it's critical the public knows that you're doing this and that things are available for them to make comments. Um, I'll be looking forward to the South Shore group because I kind of feel as though we're misunderstood and left out quite a bit. Because quite frankly, the, the, T, the T garage in out of Quincy does not have any frequent buses at all. Our buses run either every 60 minutes or every 90 minutes, except for, um, um, excuse me, except for working hours where, you know, people are going to, they're just basically every half hour or every 20 minutes during a high frequency morning and evening commute. Um, one of the concerns I have are the moving of bus stops. Now, I understand that there was, I know there was a survey, survey done of all the bus stops in the system. And there are already some stops that have been changed. The problem is there's no notice of the changes. Um, there's no way for the public to know that a bus stop has changed. Um, I live in Braintree uh, at the corner of Roosevelt and Washington Street, which is Route 37. Our bus, actually our bus stop was changed about two years ago. And unfortunately, Braintree does not enforce the ordinance regarding snow removal. So moving the stop away from, from being right at, at Roosevelt and Washington meant that we pretty much had to go in the street because people don't shovel their walks. The only thing they do is shovel the walk to from the from the sidewalk to, <clears throat> excuse me, their their, mail, their mailboxes. Um, so it's been dicey just trying to travel since yeah. the changes have been made. There were changes made last summer in Quincy Center, and there was no notice. Right. Um, <clears throat> I work at excuse me, I work at the. Farmer's Market at Quincy Center on, on Fridays. Uh, I found out by accident and the driver didn't know that things had been changed yet. Um, but there was no indication at the old bus stop that there was a new bus stop. Um, I found out by accident, started yeah. using it. And at one point when I'm getting on the bus, there's a little kid running, running down the street and his mother's got a, a carriage. And he'd been, she'd been picking him up from uh, the Taekwondo studio 
they had no idea. And she said, I've got a baby and a chubby little kid who's really trying to catch the bus. Um, it's important for the public to be um, noticed, notified when these kind of changes happen. Um, it's not a matter, it's a matter of not, not just dealing with people with disabilities. It's a matter of public safety. Yes. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I don't know, Caroline, if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, um, Joanne, hi. I think um, we've we've met a few times, um, and I'm planning to come present to the BCIL group um, in a few weeks as well. So I think we'd love to hear more about um, any thoughts or suggestions that you might have on ways that we can better get the word out. Um, we are in the process of getting out um, all of our car cards and digital ads and all sorts of things. So um, I apologize if um, there wasn't enough awareness for this one meeting, but I, I do think in the next week you will be overwhelmed by all of the different advertisements that you will see on this project, but we always are looking for other ways that we can get the word out. So I would love to hear from you on that more next time we, we meet. Thanks. And now I am going to turn to you there have been a, a lot of comments and people patiently waiting um, for a lot of the meetings. So I do want to address um, some of the written comments. And actually, Shana, do you mind advancing to the next slide? Because um, I do want to also remind people that if you go to the website, the mbta.com uh, BNRD, there's also an online form where you can submit your comments um, there and especially very specific root specific comments. We really encourage you to do that through there. And also you can continue to leave comments in the Q&A and we are recording them and taking them all in as well. Um, one of the questions uh, that appeared a few times that I saw in the Q&A is about transfers and what does a two and three seat ride mean? So I don't know if anyone from the team um, can give a little bit more context about that first. Yeah, sorry, that was us maybe using transit planner speak. Um, so when we say two, three seat ride, that that just means kind of how many different um, transit trips you're taking. So are you taking two buses? Are you taking a bus and rapid transit? Are you taking three buses to kind of um, complete your trip? And then I also noticed related to that, a question about what the T indicates on our maps. Um, so when you see um, a route that has a T in front of it, that means that it is one of our high frequency routes that runs 15 minutes or better all day, seven days a week from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. So just wanna, wanted to clarify on those, those two things. And also, can I, I saw another question about the T. These aren't the final names though, right? No, um, that is, is in progress um, and you know, dependent on what the final map looks like. I think we were we we're kind of just wanting to, to test out a way to distinguish between the high frequency routes and the other route types. So um, if you have comments on the route nomenclature specifically, if you really like it or you really hate it, please feel free to also let us know how you feel about it. But we're using that right now, again, just for kind of this planning phase of the, of the project. When we actually create new maps, that'll be an entirely different kind of process to, to figure that out. Thanks, Caroline. I'm also focusing, um, oh, and I think, uh, Christoph, um, you might actually want to speak to that as well. Yeah, no, I think one of the things we want to do with a new network is really make it clear to riders where the high frequency routes are. Right now we have something called key bus routes, but if you're standing at a bus stop, there's no way to tell the difference between a frequent bus and an infrequent one. And even looking at the bus map, it's really hard to identify what the frequent buses are. So part of the idea behind something like the T is to really help people identify where the most frequent routes are to help them plan their trips better. Um, and the T is one way of doing that. What happens at bus stops can be part of that. What the maps look like can be part of that. And that's all things that the MBTA will be looking at. It ways to better communicate the new network to riders. And I'm still gonna focus in on the written comments right now because we do have a lot of them. Um, Jay had some early comments and one was echoed by by some other folks is, I'll ask it in two parts. The first is how many of the people on the project team actually use and ride the bus? And also there was a clarification question, I think in the introductory remarks, we say 25% increase, and is that 25% over what number? 
So what are we using as the baseline? So I will start with Caroline on this and let others jump in. Yes, I think all of us on the project team ride the bus regularly. Um, I'm particularly proud of my bus earrings too that are of the 89 bus. Um, <laughs> so um, yes, that's really important. I'm actually glad someone asked that because it is really important to have that experience and um, and and understand what, what it actually is like to ride the bus. But um, the second question, Reagan, sorry, what was the second question? The 25% increase, what is oh, it over? What's sure. the baseline? Yes, um, Melissa, I might need your help clarifying here, but basically it's 25% um, increase in the operating budget pre-pandemic. I don't actually remember the exact um, year that we're starting from. I don't know, Melissa, if you want to add more to that. Certainly. Uh, so we're looking to increase service to have 25% more uh, service hours than what we operated pre-COVID. Uh, and that said, we're still actually not quite up to 100%. We're about 90, I want to say about 93% of pre-COVID. So this is getting us back to not just 100%, but then to 125% of what we were operating pre-COVID. Thanks, Melissa. Melissa. Um, so there is a question here a little bit about maps generally and i'm going to try to combine some some comments into one question one is sort of about this idea of topography and hills and what kinds of considerations that's given when the maps are drawn and also there was another comment about the commuter rail lines not being shown on the map and, and those connections so i don't know if we can speak to the maps sort of generally and how they're created Sure. Um, yeah, so so we basically just took the existing bus network map and and more or less um, utilize that same style to recreate it. Um, again, I think there's potentially an opportunity here to to think about a different bus map, but that's not what this spe specific part in the process that we're at now. Um, so so that's um, we, we didn't account for topography. Um, in the map, though, I will uh, give a lot of credit to the Office of Performance Management and Innovation. Um, if I can, um, the, the, if, if folks ever look at their uh, data blog, which is online, they recently posted one about what we call busable streets. So essentially looking at streets that have a gradient where you can actually run a bus, um, which is not all streets. Um, so I would definitely recommend that folks who wanna kind of geek out on topography and street infrastructure and buses to take a look at that. Um, was there a second part to that map question, Reagan? Sorry. It was about the commuter rail connections. And I think, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, feel free, but I believe that the, the commuter rail connections were taken into account in terms of design, but they're just not being shown because the map was getting kind of, kind of cluttered. But is that correct or do I have that wrong? Yes, yes, I think that is correct. It is really hard to, I've learned a lot about maps um, over the past few months. And I will say our street network um, makes it really challenging to make them very uh, legible. So yes, we we definitely took a look at some of our commuter rail stations, um, but we're focused more on the rapid transit connections, I'll say. And I do see also a comment. I know that we made a mistake earlier when we said the email address was uh, community engagement at mbti.com. And I want to emphasize that the correct email is public engagement at mbta.com. So apologies again for getting that wrong. Um, so lots of great comments. I would say keep writing your comments and your feedback. Um, I'm seeing a lot of comments about the service in the Leachmere area. And I don't know if someone wants to speak to some of that decision-making around the Leachmere connections and why there are changes in that area. Yeah, I think I think Melissa can talk to that, and maybe we can just keep her spotlight on because I feel like she'll have a lot of answers to all these questions. <laughs> Certainly. So um, we do have a number of changes proposed to uh, some of the existing routes that operate into Leachmere today. Very uh, much so. The 80, 87, and 88 have 
uh, substantial changes or are not shown in our future network or are being combined with other uh, routes. And the main reason for that is because uh, we are planning for uh, implementation uh, in the context of the future Green Line extension opening, uh, which is slated to be completed later, later this year. So definitely in the time frame that we're looking at. So it, it's not just that uh, we're proposing changes to these bus routes, but uh, we're trying to make sure that we're you know, not duplicating the new Green Line extension that we're putting in, but that we can uh, think about how uh, future ridership would work. So uh, for example, uh, with the Route 80, which is probably the route that uh, most closely parallels the Green Line, uh, there are a number of changes. So uh, the, the places that are uh, immediately closest to those Green Line stations at Ball Square, or Magoon Square, or um, the uh, East Somerville Station, uh, there uh, is proposed to be uh, no replacement for the 80, whereas there would still be uh, the portion of the 80 that serves Arlington uh, would uh, sort of get, uh, we would still have service on uh, Boston Street uh, remaining. And we can get into more of the details of this as we have uh, our uh, other meetings coming up later this year. So we'll have uh, maps and other things. Um, similarly, uh, in the case of the 88 bus on uh, Highland Ave uh, that connects uh, from Clarendon Hill and Davis Square, uh, Highland Ave over to Leachmere, many parts of Highland Ave would be within walking distance of the new Green Line extension. So the, the demand in that area is changing. But what we've done is we've taken the outer end of the 88, the Clarendon Hill portion to Davis and sort of added that on to the Route 90 and given the 90 better frequency. So um, the 88 isn't there, but the 90 is filling in for some parts of that route uh, that don't overlap with the Green Line. So those are just a couple uh, illustrations of some of the changes that we have. Um, route 87 is one that I have actually been seeing on some of the um, forums that I'm on and uh, from some of the feedback that we've gotten in already that um, some of the folks who today uh, are able to have a single direct ride on the Route 87 are looking at the possibility of having to take a three seat ride, sorry to be jargony. So having to make two transfers uh, to uh, one bus to another bus to a third bus potentially. And those are things that we're digging into looking at to see, you know, did we get everything right? Are there options that we can do to make that transfer experience um, less onerous? Uh, so those are things that we're absolutely taking to heart and uh, listening. Uh, and and sharpening our pencils and checking to see what we can do as we're um, preparing to finalize the network uh, later this year. It's fair to say, Melissa, that we really want everyone's feedback on this because people people know their own roots very well, and that's really what we're looking for. Um, so, you know, the more specific I think people can be with about their roots and and their travel patterns and their comments, um, I think the more helpful it will be. If I may say that. Um, I also have noticing, um, and then I, I think I'm gonna try to switch to, to the verbal comments soon, um, but there's a, a fair number of questions about what I now have learned is called bus bunching, which is when a route that's supposed to be very high frequency, that sometimes there are big lags and then two buses or three buses arrive sort of all at the same time. And there seems to be concern that with these new high frequency routes um, that that might occur. Um, can, is there anyone who could speak to that? I'm going to look at Melissa, but it might be others. I'll take a crack. One of the things that we're very much interested in doing, it's not just about providing a different network, but we're also looking to take this as a sort of blueprint of, you know, anywhere we have high frequency service proposed, those would be our top priorities for partnering with roadway owners, whether that's municipalities or MassDOT or DCR or others um, to see, you know, are there opportunities to get transit priority so that we can make the service more uh, reliable uh, and faster, but really it's, it's about the reliability because um, that's key in terms of customers, what we hear, uh, wanting a predictable experience uh, and not having to, you know, budget an extra 20 minutes for a trip uh, that might be um, much shorter than that some of the time. So uh, we, we absolutely want to be able to, uh, once we finalize this network, uh, use this as sort of our, our vision for where we should be prioritizing the priority as we move forward. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I don't know if anyone from the 
uh, maybe Andrew wants to jump in there as well if he has anything to add on this. I um, just want to add that we're always looking to partner with municipalities and roadway owners on transit priority. Um, and we're definitely looking into um, expanding our transit priority network through this process, making sure that our service is reliable. So not sure if you had any specific questions and, on us. And yeah. Andrew, I'm realizing that I didn't introduce you um, and you were not in the part of the presentation. So do you mind introducing yourself? I apologize. Sure. No worries. Um, my name is Andrew McFarland. I am the manager of bus system enhancements at the MBTA. Um, so working on the implementation team for the MBTA. Yeah, and I would really emphasize here that the reason we've all got better bus logos behind us, and this is called the Better Bus Project, is this isn't just a bus network redesign. This is part of a comprehensive plan at MBTA to really transform the entire bus experience. And bus priority is a huge part of that. We know how much reliability matters. The, the difference between a reliable bus and an unreliable bus may be the difference between somebody keeping their job or not keeping their job because they didn't show up on time. This is incredibly important. Um, and what we're really seeing here, like Caroline said at the beginning, is that redesigning routes goes along with bus priority, goes along with bus stop improvements, goes along with fleet improvements, goes along with better passenger information to really change this entire experience. And that bus priority, which is an essential part of this project, we cannot implement this map until we do a lot more bus priority on the ground, actually enables a better connected network. You can run a short route because a bus route's unreliable, but what you're doing by running a shorter route is forcing more people to transfer. We wanna take advantage of bus priority to actually make routes longer and better connected and provide better service to more people. Um, but that's where those municipal partnerships will be essential. We've shown how much good bus priority and bus lanes can do. We need a lot more of them to really make the bus experience great. So I will note that we're approaching time and I do wanna take a few verbal comments and maybe one more um, of the Q&A. Actually, I'll do one Q&A then we'll switch to verbal, but I will note there's a lot of people with their hands raised and I don't think we're gonna to get to everyone tonight, um, but what I would encourage you to do is put your comments in, uh, in Q&A uh, in, the, in the written form. Also take the survey, the subsequent meetings, there's a lot. There's gonna be a lot of opportunities, um, but we're, we're going through as many of these as we can. So let me ask Melissa quickly, a quick question. Uh, and actually Caroline, are we able to go a little bit past 7.30? Are you okay with that? Yeah, I think okay. I think staff is ready to stand by for a little yeah. bit longer. We, we, we so have many questions. <laughs> yeah, and we are we are limited by our availability of our interpreters and our uh, captioners. So but we will we will stay past 7.30. But um, still, um, I did just want to do a time check. So um, Melissa, I'm seeing a lot of questions about the Route 89 in um, Davis Square, and I don't know if you want to comment on sort of those decisions and choices. Certainly. So uh, there uh, was a, a there were a few questions about the connections between uh, Winter Hill and Davis Square in particular. Uh, in the proposed network, we have uh, promoted the Route 101 on. Broadway in the Winter Hill area to be all day high frequency. And we've also extended that connection over to uh, Kendall Square and Leachmere. Uh, but kind of the, the, the trade off involved with that is that the direct connection from Winter Hill to Davis uh, is no longer there. Now, there still is uh, one transfer. Uh, so, uh, one option there's, there's numbers of, a number of different options. Uh, folks could take the new high frequency. T101 and connect to the new high frequency T96, which um, I think is one option. There's also the, um, there's there's other redundant options that uh, involve, uh, you know, taking it to Kendall and backtracking, but I think that's probably slower than the bus to bus transfer on the T96 and T101. Uh, and this, it all comes down to, uh, today we have the service on Broadway with two different routes that, um, it's not very easy to keep service evenly spaced and coordinated. So, you know, one of them might be every, depending on time of day, say 20 or 25 minutes, and the other one might be every 30 minutes. And that can cause just by virtue of the, the different cycle lengths uh, for service to be sort of jumpy. 
uh, or, or, or bunched. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do is to have a single root uh, with uh, more frequent. Uh, and this is one of four new high frequency roots in Somerville, for example, uh, that uh, we're very excited about. But that does mean that some folks would have a transfer to complete that. Trip. So that's that's one example. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so I think, as promised, uh, thank you all for being patient uh, who are waiting to provide verbal comments. Um, I will ask, and I may be strict and try to enforce that you keep your comments very short because um, we have a lot of people who want to speak tonight and we want to get to as many people as possible. So um, I think we'll start with Naftali. Um, and Amanda, can you unmute? Neftali, you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, so maybe I'm not able to speak right now. Wait, hang on. Oh, oh there you are. Hang on, so sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, I'll try to make this quick, you know, about one improvement that, that needs to be made. Um, I think the Sierra line is currently not at the gold or sewer standards. Um, it gets stuck in the Tailwinds tunnel as well as mixed traffic on the um, on the surface. I mean, I, I do I do have a solution. Um, I think I think the Sur line tunnel needs to be extended from the World Trade Station, you know, underneath the um, Tailwinds Town to like a new um, airport station underneath the central parking garage. And then and then the tunnel be extended to the to the old airport station to allow for an in-system connection with the blue line. Then the, then, then the tunnel would exit onto the, onto the Martin A. Coffin bypass ro road and, um, and then follow the existing route to Chelsea. You know, the new airport station underneath the um, terminal would have walkways to, to all the terminals. And then, and then from South Station, you know, you know, the tunnel should be extended yeah. to connect with the Tufts Medical Center and maybe the Chinatown stations and then and then surface and then run in a rebuilt median Washington Street bus lane okay. with like complete track single priorities. And and then just a couple more things. Well, actually, I, we really I really want to get to Buses the next in the tunnel would have optical guidance to increase the speed limit and that and then bike rack should also be built on the um, okay. on the um, buses as well. So Naftali, thank you. I'm gonna actually, if you if you write your comments in the Q and A, we can capture all of it and your suggestions. Um, I do wanna. I'm gonna be just the. A couple quick oh. responses, if I can. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, sure, Melissa. Sorry. Um, just uh, two things. Uh, I know uh, we do have some proposals for the airport service. It's not quite as ambitious as the tunnel ideas that you're proposing, but I did want to flag that we are looking to make the SL1 and SL3 a little bit faster and more direct. I know uh, one of the things that we've been looking at is, you know, sometimes if you get off the Ted Williams Tunnel and you're right there next to World Trade Center Station and you think, gosh, would it be faster for me to exit the bus I'm on, walk down the stairs to the platform and try to get onto a bus that's in front of the one that I'm on now? Um, because the process of going out to Silver Line Way and then you have the transition onto the, the uh, catenary wire can sometimes take some time. So we do actually have a proposal to shorten the route. It does mean that uh, those SL1 and SL3 would omit Silver Line Way, but this is a possibility with the new fleet of buses that uh, is getting delivered uh, to replace the existing dual mode articulated buses. So the new uh, hybrid buses that have a hush mode um, no longer have that same requirement to be able to go to Silver Line Way and um, change their, their, their power mode. It does require some transition, uh, some construction at the mouth of the transit way right at D Street, but it's only a small amount of construction, uh, not anything as uh, costly as uh, an extra uh, tunnel across the harbor or something. It's more just intersection geometry so that we can make the turn in and out of the busway. And then also, uh, it's my understanding that those new buses that are replacing the DMAs will actually have uh, bicycle wrecks on them. That's what I've heard from our uh, vehicle engineering team. So uh, in response to what you uh, mentioned, Natalia, so thank you. 
And thank you, Melissa. And I'm being hard and fast because I'm I'm learning that our ASL interpreters do have to leave early, so we can we will have a hard stop at 7:40. Um, so, but we will keep going and try to get to as many as possible. Um, I'm going to skip over Jay because I've I know that uh, he had some questions in Q and A, and we answered them um, some of them already. But again, encourage people to submit comments. Um, I'll go to Knall. Next, Amanda, can you unmute? Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you. Welcome. Okay, awesome. So I have a fairly long set of comments, but I'm just going to touch on some basic things. Um, so I'm my perspective is coming from Lexington and looking at the current frequency and the reduction that it's going to see, as well as one major um, skip stop at the high school. So the 70s, I, I just wanted to kind of almost flag uh, the fact that 76 currently has a solid amount of ridership during peak hours, but that ridership is coming from the stops that that would be bypassed and just kind of bring that concern to light. As well as another thing being that I could see that there would be potential with creating like a T level 15 minutes or better Lexington Center to Redline uh, Alewife um, trunk along that stretch of, of Mass Ave, but that doesn't seem to be utilized. So maybe exploring those to kind of improve the number of people that would ride that route. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to respond to the comment or should we? Just super briefly, there, there is a route change proposed for the 76 uh, to make a more direct route. One of the things that we were trying to do is um, make less sort of serpentine routes, but that does mean that uh, the, the short stretch right in front of Lexington High School uh, isn't on our proposed 76. It's still within walking distance of the 62. Uh, and also I did want to flag 62 new Sunday service. We're uh, wicked excited about that. So now folks can you know, do uh, different things on Sundays or you know, we often had heard from uh, folks in Lexington, you know, how am I supposed to get to my, my Sunday grocery store job if there is no uh, bus that even operates to that grocery store. So uh, now people have more options available to them even on weekends. Thanks, Melissa. Um, Caroline, I, do you want to go to the next slide? And yeah, I think it's for, I think it's a little back, Shana. It's like maybe two slides back. I just wanted to kind of make sure folks again had all the information here on how to provide input, because um, I know we have a lot of questions and and hands hands raised, and we we won't be able to get to all of them today. Um, but there are many different events and opportunities to provide input. So definitely, if we didn't get to your question or comment today, we're definitely tracking everything in the Q&A. Um, but also, if you're looking for us to, to respond right away to uh, feel free to use one of these, uh, or especially the Better Bus Project email address or attend one of the other events as well for, for other opportunities. Just wanted to flag that. And I push the feedback form too, as well. Yes. Um, Okay, so let me uh, go to Maria Elena and Amanda, can you unmute? Hi, um, I'm a lifelong resident of East Cambridge. We recently lost our Leechmere station to the other side of uh, McGrath O'Brien Highway uh, with no safe, easy access to get over there. Uh, my neighborhood is the second oldest neighborhood in Cambridge. There are a lot of lifelong residents, a lot of elderly and disabled. We have um, two large housing complexes that house exclusively elderly and disabled. Um, we are designated now just to retain the 69 bus, losing the 80, the 87, and the 88. I think this is outrageous. A lot of people from East Cambridge use those buses. They, they shop in Somerville. They go on Somerville Ave. They go to Davis Square. They go to McKinnon's and, and Market Basket. They go to the Somerville Hospital. Um, I have no idea. I think it's great that other people are getting more services, but really we've lost everything. We've lost our station and we've lost most of our bus routes now. I mean, you're adding something that is wonderful for people in North Point so they can get over to Kendall Square. That's great. I feel like my tax dollars are subsidizing Kendall and North Point and Longwood, all where the big bucks biotech is. 
What about the seniors? I want someone to sit down with the seniors and tell them how they can make three changes on a bus carrying bundles or going back and forth to the doctors. I think this plan is outrageous for East Cambridge. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Um, so there is there is a question in the chat that I do want to get to is the next virtual meeting. So actually, Shana, if you don't mind, I know Caroline had slides earlier with the upcoming meetings. Sorry. There we are. So there's going to be a series of uh, regional meetings, as Caroline mentioned, um, and also the website has the complete meeting schedule. So if we can cycle through, there's a meeting Tuesday, then the following week in Boston, and then June 8th, and then June 16th, and then June 22nd, June 28th. And we also have a series of open houses at stations, et cetera. Um, Caroline, I'm gonna turn it over to you to see if there's any last minute questions or things you wanna address, comments. Oh my gosh, um, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so I think um, I just, again, want to reiterate, like, thank you, everyone, for all of your engagement tonight. We like we we are recording and we'll have in writing all of the the questions and um, that and comments that that we received. Um, and again, if we didn't if we didn't get to you, apologies, um, we have um, many more opportunities, as as Reagan just described here for um, for folks to to provide their their input, so I really do hope that you attend some of these other events that um, we had planned for more um, time for more Q and A as well. So I just want to highlight that today, too. Um, right, the and, other and, the other events will be less presentation heavy, Caroline. Yes, is that yes, that is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes, they will be less presentation heavy and uh, more time allocated to having conversation with folks or planning breakout groups and other such things so that we can really have a longer conversation with everyone and, and hear from you all. Um, wanna mention too, all of these are listed um, on our website. Um, I think there's actually a vanity link. So it's mbta.com slash bnrd, B-N-R-D events. If we can maybe go back to the how to provide feedback page. Um, um, just, just so everyone is aware. So all of these are, are listed, um, there as well. Um, I think, I think unfortunately we have to wrap because our, um, ASL interpreters have to, have to leave soon, but again, really do appreciate all of your public comments today and hope that you all stay engaged in this project. We've planned for a lot of different opportunities to hear from you all. Um, so I hope hope we continue to do that. This plan will really be made better by hearing from everyone. Um, so, so thanks again for, for your engagement on that. And um, with that, I hope everyone has a good rest of their evening as well. <laughs>